Welcome to the Walk in Truth Christian Fellowship Church broadcast on the WITRN Network. Come join us as we study the Word of God together. Go get your Bible and let's see what the Holy Spirit is saying to us today. Welcome to Walk the Truth Christian Fellowship Church. We thank you for listening to our broadcast today. We hope that you hear something that will encourage you, inspire you, and uplift you and ask the age-old question, what must I do to be saved? Amen. Amen. We thank God for you just tuning in and being with us. We want to give a shout out to our churches in Africa. We bless you. We're praying for you. And Pastor Timothy, we love you and continue to do what you're doing, giving out the gospel in your country and in your space. Amen. So we just thank God today that we can come together on this Father's Day in worship in spirit and in truth. Yeah. I'm excited today because we got one our own that came home, just flew Amen. by for a minute. Amen. That's going to give us a word. Amen. 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 So we just thank God today that uh, uh, Heather and Zach and family are here in business. Yeah. We just thank God for you. And we just we just want you to feel welcome. Amen. Amen. If you need anything, just ask them guys right there. And they'll go get you water, coffee, tea, or milk. We got it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So thank God. Thank God. Thank God. I'm going to start off today Amen. by first wishing fathers again. Happy Father's Day. Yeah. Yeah. Happy Father's Day. And... Uh, you know, every year I think of a theme, and the Lord hadn't given me a theme until I heard Sister Kate talk about this. And it's change. The theme for this year for us is, do you have, are you going to accept the challenge to change? Amen. Yes. You know, I was thinking about change, and, 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 and I was thinking about Gideon. When the angel showed up and said, you call him a man of valor. At the point of him being a coward. And it's like, Change is first is in the mind. Yes. Before it can come out to be a thing that we can see, he called him a man of valor. He called him something that he will be, but he wasn't yet. Okay. But he had to change. Yes. And see, all of us, we need to learn how to change. Change is critical. Yes. Without change, there's no movement. Yes. There's no blessing. There's no delivery. You have to get it in your mind that change is okay. Yes. As a church, we didn't got so comfortable. Yes. The older people are stuck in their ways. The younger people won't grow up. But see, I want to challenge you to change. Older saints, lighten up. Younger saints, grow up. It's time to change. And the church's mission is not necessarily here. We come here to fellowship, but it's out there. It's out there. That's why we broadcast to the world. It's out there somewhere. You never know who's going to listen to you. You never know who's sitting back waiting for a message of change. And then I, as I read Luke, I understand since we're in the book of Luke, in the New Testament, the book of, in, uh, in uh, First Kings in the Old Testament, I'm realizing that this word of God is about change. Amen. Amen. And deliverance. Yes. Think about it. You can't be delivered from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light without some kind of change. Come on. Mm, right. You can't go from a bad husband to a good husband without some kind of change. Yes. So when you become a father, you walk from, I was a young man and I did boyish things, but when I became a man, a father, I changed. Yes. And I put away those childish things. Yes. And you ladies, you are the purveyor of change. You birth change. Every baby you have, every child you help, you have helped change us. So change is inevitable. But it's funny how in the 21st century, on some things we run to change, but then other things we just want to just don't want to grow up. We just want things to stay the same. But mm -hmm. as we look in the mirror every day, we're changing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And all I want you to do is embrace change because it's critical for your growth in Christ. Everybody's not like you. I'm gonna talk to them. Everybody's not like you. <laughs> there are some saints of God that you just don't look like. Mm -hmm. But they still God's children. Yes. So who needs to change? You or them? You need to change. Yes. Show some grace. Yes. And it'll go a long way to change your heart. Amen. Amen. That's all I got Amen. to say. Amen. Let's get a load of hands and have a praise. Amen. 
next up, we're going to have Minister K. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Now, today is truly the day that the Lord has given us, and we're going to rejoice and be glad. And i tell you one thing. Yeah, I got that. I know. What you laughing at, Travis? I know. I ain't, I, it ain't like I got on a hill, hill. You know, I'm going to feel slide like I got on a two-inch hill. But, you know, I just wanted to get up here, and I just wanted to thank God for, you know, for you fathers on today. Because it's truly a blessing for, you know, the men that we have in our church. When you think you ain't doing something, you're doing something. So I just, you know, on my way here, I was receiving this. I like to deal with words. God deal with me through words. And my word today is Father's Day, right? Okay. So I'm just going to read it. And I hope I, you know, it, 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 it blesses you on today. Um, it ain't in perfect standing, but it's in good standing it's with me in the Lord. Amen. 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 Let's say, may, uh, for, for you fathers on Father's Day, may God show his favor in your life. May he add to your life peace, joy, and steadfastness. T, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lead not to your own understanding. H, your hearts are being transformed continually. E, may you learn to endure and trust in yourself. And what God is doing into you. Um, R, may you be restored, refreshed on this day, knowing that you are you are chosen by God for good works. S, may your service for the Lord be a sweet savor to those you come in contact with. D, Lord, deliver the Lord will deliver you from anything that may um, that cause you to doubt. Remember Amen. that. It, we all doubt, but the Lord is the only one that can deliver you. A, may the Lord bless you to achieve great things. Why? Always yield to the Spirit of God. Always. No, don't worry about anything else, but when you yield to the Spirit of God, guess what? You can do great things in your life. And that also, like Pastor was saying, will bring about the change. When you trust in the change that God is doing in you, change starts happening in your life is inevitable, especially when you call by God. When you call by God, change is going to happen. You're going to go through a lot of different things. So you guys being as fathers on this day, just accept the change that God is doing in you because it, it, it ain't nothing bad about it. It's always good, but you have to accept the change on this Father's Day so that you can be the best man that you can be in your children's life, your mother's life, anybody you surround. So just remember, Happy Father's Day to all you all. Amen. 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 Thank you. Uh, Got a song for us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Good morning. Oh 
Celebrate Father's Day, like I say, with one of our own. Amen. Amen. It's, it's kind of interesting, like when I ask her to come, she always lights up. <laughs> and I'm glad of that. Yes. You know, because sometimes when you when, when people go on to do bigger and better things, you know, they just don't feel like coming back home no more. Amen. But I thank God for the whole family. Amen. Amen. They loved us. Amen. And we loved on them. So I'm not gonna even belay the Mary. Y'all know who this is. Let's give a hand for Sister Heather. Amen. Yay! Good to see y'all's faces. It feels like a lifetime, but it hasn't been. <laughs> Amen. Um, let's let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into it. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Father God, we come before you this morning thanking you for fellowship. Oh God, we thank you for family. We thank you for just bringing us all together under the banner of your light, under the banner of your love, oh God, under the banner of your word, Father. Lord, feed us. Father God, use me to speak to your people in a way that you want them spoken to, say what you need to say, do what you need to do, oh God. And we will bless you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, good morning, family. It is morning. so good to be here. Thank you so much for having me this morning. It is a blessing and an honor to be able to share the word of God with you this morning. Uh, I am here from All Nations Church, whose pastor and ministerial staff send you greetings this amen. morning. Amen. Um, originally, I was actually going to talk about something else. Um, I was going to preach the sermon that I preached a couple weeks ago um, at my church. No fuss, no muss, easy peasy, right? Um, but God stopped me in prayer on Wednesday, and he asked me, will I submit? Would I be willing to receive another message? And I was like, yeah, Jesus, do what you do. <laughs> I mean, what I'm going to say now, right? <laughs> so I opened up the breadth of the book, and I started studying, and I let him lead the way. And so I, I, it was miraculous to open up the book, to, to have God be my tour guide. Um, so I was looking for what to preach, and he pulled me back to James, which is actually what our Saturday morning Bible study has been studying since January. And we are only up to uh, James 2. So I began reading in James 3, but I needed to go back to kind of get James's train of thought. Like, how did he get up to this point? And so I read up to the last verse that we did in class, and I felt the Lord say, that's it. That one, Heather, right there. Because I need to show you something that you didn't see last week. Mm. And so God stopped me with a question that James asked his, uh, his, the people who were reading his letter. God stalled me. I mean, he literally would not let me continue. And James was asking a question in James 2.14. He said, can faith save him? Mm. 
And so today we're going to be looking at one verse, James 2.14, and it reads, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Now, this question, James, asks, is surrounded by theological uh, controversy for some people. One, the, the, it stirs up the Catholics, and frankly, that pisses off the Baptists. And this question of, of uh, faith and works is huge. This question, if folks uh, either they think they can work their way into heaven, or they sit on their laurels uh, thinking about faith as some ambiguous, definitionless thing in hopes that when the time comes, Jesus is going to receive the faith that they have. And usually that faith believes, but it doesn't feel the need to manifest anything. Now the church collective, though we shouldn't, we still struggle sometimes with what seems like this contradiction, faith and works. Paul's understanding that, that we are saved by faith alone apart from the deeds of the law and then James's belief that we are saved by faith and works. Now, who am I talking to, right? Um, Y'all know that it is neither a contradiction nor a paradox. These two men were talking about the same thing from two different perspectives. From Paul's perspective, we're not under the law, so it, faith has nothing to do with observing the law. And then from James's perspective, if our faith doesn't manifest into works, it is dead. Now, we just need to get that out of the way before we really look into this question that James asks. Can faith save him? This is the one of the most prominent, deeply delving, controversial, mind-melting questions that James presents in this entire book. Can faith save him? When we first we read the question, we think James is asking something rhetorical. Can faith save him? Of course faith can save him because faith can save everybody. That's what our thought is. It seems like the answer should be an immediately and thoughtless yes until we realize that James is not approaching faith like we sometimes do. Hmm. Now, we think that we can walk or run up the aisle or shout or speak in some watermelon hobbalabla jing jong tongues <laughs> or come up to the altar when the pastor calls for a prayer or even come to church on Sunday when the rest of the week we live in like hell. Come on, come on, we think that that's faith. We believe that that's the faith that James is talking about. And even more, we believe that that is the very definition of faith. And in fact, faith is, is as, uh, as a concept is as ambiguous. Um, if someone asks for the definition of faith, we immediately quote Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. But what does that really mean? Realistically, ethically. Are we, are we just quoting a scripture thinking it's like some spell book that we can absorb by osmosis? Hmm. Do we know what that means? And usually when we think of faith, we think of it in terms of quantity. But James thinks of faith in terms of quality. Okay. What is faith? What is saving faith? What shape is it? What color is it? What are its hues? What are its shadows? What are its highlights? What are its attributes? What does it manifest or produce? The idea of faith can be ambiguous. It's like God, invisible. And the only way that we can see God is by what he produces. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. James is using what, what is made by faith to manifest what is manifested from faith, what is produced by faith, what is surrounded by faith to define faith. So that the only thing that we can understand saving faith, or the only way that we can understand it is by what faith, saving faith does. Yes, to us faith is ambiguous force that roams in the ether without definition, without tangibility, without structure, and therefore without 
standards sometimes. But faith is not that to James, nor is it that to the guy who wrote Hebrews. The guy who wrote Hebrews said that faith is a substance, mm -hmm. that it has evidence. Mm -hmm. In fact, James believed that so much that as he started writing his book, his intent was to define what faith is exactly to his readers by showing us what faith does. Now, did you know that James was one of the first books written, that in Galatians? It dates back to about 49 AD. Now, these two books are like the first Gospels because, in a sense, they are moving the Jews from obedience to the 619 laws, which were not all the laws of Moses, onto the law of grace and obedience to God's progressive revelation through the Holy Spirit. The Jews were transitioning from an external tutelage of the law to an internal mechanism which was led by God from the inside. They were being led by God from the inside. And like I said, it was transition. They had to move from an understanding of faith in terms of pharisaical teachings, which was based on performance, to God leading, which was based on the quality of their belief. Some Christians were confused between performing faith like the Pharisees, and the quality of faith in God, which led to some weird hybrid mismatch of definitions of what faith is. And so a time of performing statutes and calling it faith was over. They were transitioning into a new mechanism where faith came first and the works were done through the faith, through loyalty, through obedience, through love of God. And from the very beginning of this letter, from the very first verse, James begins to reconstruct how these old Jews and new Christians define and should understand what faith is by what it does. And again, they were in the period of transition. And I believe that God sends folks with a time-specific message that is meant to help recenter them and refocus and revelate his people to a deeper understanding of the true nature of the kingdom. God is making adjustments to, in his people. Let me tell you, I've been dealing with sciatica for like weeks now. It's horrible. Like I can't sleep well at night. I mean, Amen. look, it's a real thing. Yeah. <laughs> and this nerve is compressed by my spine. That's what sciatica is. And it shoots pain down your leg. And somebody told me, you should just go to a chiropractor. And I just cannot stand the idea of hearing my bones crack because I have this fear that a guy who got all D's in chiropractor school, he's going to pull a little too hard and paralyze me, and then the kids are going to have to feed me and clothe me and wipe my butt. I mean, that fear runs deep. And if you've ever been to a chiropractor, they tell you to sit there and relax while they adjust you. And you hear your neck crack and you hear your spine snapping in places that your spine sh you shouldn't hear that that's not natural I don't think <laughs> because over time what happens is through the process of living how we stand how we move our movements shift our bones out of alignment and the doctor comes he uses pressure and swift movements to adjust those bones back into place so that the body works efficiently and effectively. That is what the book of James is. It is an adjustment. He's moving you this way, cracking you that way. He's getting us back into alignment so that we can understand how to walk in this spiritual life, how to walk with Christ, how to understand who the Holy Spirit is, what he does, and where he's leading us. And so, um, he, he was trying to get these people adjusted and, and trying to progress them in their understanding of God and concepts of faith so that every once in a while we have to be adjusted and we have to catch up. Now, a pastor uh, told me not too long ago um, when I was talking about progressive revelation, he told me, well, scripture is scripture. What we know about it is just what it is. It really isn't progressive because Jesus already came. 
And while that's true, absolutely true, right? Scripture is what it is. God is who he is. Jesus did already come once already, right? We wait waiting for the second time. What is what uh, what is progressive isn't God, but our understanding of him. Amen. Now, Pastor right. was just talking about change, and we endure change. We endure that idea of progressive revelation because every time we experience God, every time we read his word, we always have to catch something that we didn't catch before. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is us progressing in our understanding of who God is. How we understand scripture, how we understand God, how we understand faith and its intricacies. The possibilities of understanding with an eternal God are literally limitless. Mm -hmm. There is a such thing as progressive revelation with the, within the believer because uh, we are ever progressing in our beliefs. Yeah. Scripture should always be progressing in us because we will never reach the end of God's knowledge. Amen. And if we don't open the book and see something new, something fascinating, something deeper, something more poignant, if we don't encounter areas of truth that we didn't see before, it doesn't mean that there is no progression. It means that we are not progressing. Amen. Amen. We have not grown. We are arrogant. We refuse to change. Amen. And so in this book, James is deepening uh, the understanding of the old Jews and the new Christians, uh, their understanding of what they thought that they already knew. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But for him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Matthew 25. Now, what Jesus in context is talking about is the ten virgins and the parable of the talents. But what he's really talking about is wisdom, revelation, and knowledge uh, from God to know what to do and when to do it. To know how to move forward. To understand the balance of how and when we use our faith. This book is written in transition. But you, you don't know. Um, I'm sorry. But you don't know that for, for the wise, we think that we, uh, we should see transition as an opportunity to progress. It's a goad that God's using to stick us in the back of our legs to, to get us to move forward so that we can go, move forward, get better, be better, do better. A people who will not endure transition will stagnate and die. So in, in a time of transition, we, we evaluate um, this, we evaluate who we are. We evaluate what we're doing. We refocus um, on getting that thing done that we are supposed to accomplish through the Lord. So as a go, James asks his audience, can faith save him? James is pulling them by the collar, asking them a question, asking them to refocus, forcing them to reevaluate what they believe and how they understand what they believe. His question should be shocking. It should be controversial. It should be taboo in your face because it flies in the face of everything that we thought that Jesus told us. It was always about faith. Faith this and faith that. I mean, his whole thing was faith. So if you ask, can faith save you? you it seems like you are going against what Jesus himself said. Unless it's not. Unless he wasn't. Unless it, what we understood of Jesus' teachings was just scratching the surface of faith. So from the very beginning, at the very first verse, James begins to paint a, man, a picture of the manifestation of faith. He begins to define what faith is by what it does. So in the first verse, first, uh, as first chapter, first verse, James starts off his book saying, James, a bond servant of, our, of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, what he is saying is that faith submits. When James says he is a bond servant, he is teaching us that faith submits wholly, willingly, proudly, loyally to God. 
that faith pushes us to be willing servants, slaves, not of our own will, but of the will of the Father. James defines faith as submission. Now we usually don't think of introductions of chapters as teachable, but here James packs every detail into every nook and cranny of this book. For even in the second half of the same verse, he's teaching, it, it says, uh, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Number two, faith endures tribulation and correction. Amen. Again, James is talking to the old and the new Christians, but he was also reminding them uh, about the correction that they endured. The Assyrian and the Babylonian exile, they, they are still enduring at to these, this point where they were, the persecution of folks like Saul. Um, they endured knowing that even in exile and persecution, God's purpose was being fulfilled. For Yahweh said that Israel was going to be a light to the nations. And before Jesus ascended, he said that the gospel would spread all over the entire world. That was not possible without the scattering of the people. Further, we endure persecution and correction. We learned that faith is not always unicorns and, and gold fairy dust. It's not all material possessions and more money than we can count, but it helps us to endure difficulties. Even when we can't see Jesus' hand, we believe that he is there because he said he would never leave. Amen. That even when we don't know what he's doing, we know that he is doing. Faith is encountering difficulties. Faith is asking, having to ask God hard questions. Faith is sometimes being scattered and lost and confused. But faith is also sustaining and enduring until those answers come and knowing that God has never left even if they don't. It's holding on when life is chaotic and the walk is hard and rocky, but, but still knowing that God is there through the madness, through the anxiety, through the questioning. He is working for his purpose and our good. So when we feel failure, God is working. When we want to give up, God is our strength. When we have anger, God is our peace. Yes. And when we feel disappointed, God is our hope. Yes. This book is revolutionary because it's, it's turning a, the world upside down. James is turning the world upside down. Everything that the Pharisees taught about religion, about faith, even some of the things that we still believe today, that we're blessed if we have money, fame, resources, and whatever else. Now, according to religion, those people who experience sickness and bleeding and lameness and poverty and disease, well, they're unclean or they were considered unblessed. But James is saying that material wealth does not dictate how much God has blessed us. Amen. How well we endure difficulties with intact faith does. In his book, James teaches us not to be ashamed of our troubles, instead to rejoice in them. James is defining faith as enduring tribulation. Now James, verse 5. If any of you lacks knowledge, let him ask of God, who gives liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Number three. Faith is the power of of understanding. Now James is saying that the old Jews and the new Christians no longer have to be subject to the Pharisees and the rabbis for understanding and wisdom. They went to the Pharisees and the rabbis to say, okay, well, what does this law mean? And then the Pharisees and the rabbis came up with a, another statute and another law, and, and that's how that happened. They were in charge of the wisdom. But if they don't understand something, they'll ask God now. If they don't understand now, they bypass the Pharisees and the rabbis and they ask God himself. That is monumental. Mm -hmm. now, uh, 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 
back then it was left up to the Pharisees um, and even now some of us we don't go to movies or concerts or listen to certain music before we talk to the preacher <laughs> that is idolatry yes. Yes. especially when we have the spirit of God who is leading us from the inside God is so bomb that he's giving the power back to us that the Pharisees took which said that they were the only conduits of God mm -hmm. He is giving us the power of understanding, restoring a personal connection, restoring a personal relationship, restoring a personal reliance that each one of us can have with God directly. So that while having a shepherd is helpful for order, he is never supposed to be the sole source of wisdom. And only the only place that you interpret scripture that the only time that we interpret scripture on Sunday through the pastor, no, that shall not be. Unacceptable. Amen. And if it is, what do we need the spirit for? Amen. Amen. God will give wisdom to anyone who is humble enough to ask for it. Amen. And he and has the faith enough to receive it. Amen. James is defining faith as a power of understanding. Verse 7, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from God. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Amen. Number four, faith is currency. Yeah. Now, every man is given a measure of faith according to Romans 12. So that we have the power to spend our faith however we want. And so there are plenty of TV evangelists and pastors, even around town, who are happy to tell you that your money is a seed. But Jesus said that faith is a seed. Amen. Amen. That if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. He's saying that you can trade your faith in for any purpose that you want, even to move a mountain. Even non-believers have faith. And they use their faith to build businesses and to acquire things. They use their faith to get a car, and, and they'll, they'll get on a plane and think that, you know, God's not holding them, them up there, but it's the pilot. That's faith, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you can use your faith on anything you want. But here, James is saying that you should only use your faith for things that are profitable, that are eternally worthwhile. And for him, one of those things is wisdom. He suggests reinvesting faith into kingdom purposes. James is defining faith as currency, which we use to build a kingdom. Verse 12, James says, Blessed is a man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive a crown of life, which the Lord has promised to him who love him. Number five, faith endures temptation. Now, sometimes we think if we, we've been tempted, if we've been tempted, that we've failed in our walk. But James is saying the opposite, that if you're tempted and you endure, you are actually called blessed. Amen. When we think about temptation, we think about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, it's that, but in context... What James could be actually talking about is the temptation to escape our tribulations. Mm -hmm. Now look at Job. He was going through a tribu uh, tribulation, all that trouble, boils, all kinds of just terrible things, right? And he was tempted by his wife to curse God and die. And what he was really saying is to curse God and escape the pain that you're in. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like George Washington from Hamilton, y'all seen Hamilton? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. George Washington from Hamilton said, death is easy, young man. Living is harder. Mm -hmm. To endure life through the temptation takes balls. It takes grit. It takes raw strength that only can be done through saving faith. It's natural to want to quit when, hard, when life gets hard, when affliction squeeze the life out of you. It's natural to want to give up, but how we know that we have real faith is when we don't. Mm -hmm. 
when we have the opportunity to quit and we stay because it's wise and because it honors God. This one is huge because the, the definition of faith is endurance and the temptation is of Satan. Now let me explain. If you're being tempted to quit, it's because your adversary sees something in you that he wants to deter. Wow. We think when a person isn't tempted at all in any way, it's because they are blessed and somehow beyond the reach of the devil. <laughs> but the truth is, is that the temptation only comes when Satan is threatened about your faith and what you'll build through that trial. Yeah. And so he whispers in your ear that you should give up before it gets harder. He whispers in your ear that you should give in because you want to. But let me tell you something. Trials do not mean that you are unblessed, unclean, or cursed. It means that you are powerful. He only tempts what can damage him. So count it all joy when you fall into diverse temp trials, knowing that the test of testing of your faith produces something powerful. The temptation is meant to knock you off and knock you out and put you down, you and your purpose, because beyond that temptation is a door that continues to lead you down the purpose that God has set in front of you. Now, if you aren't doing anything, if you aren't building your faith and rising up to, God, to life's challenges, you don't pose a threat. <laughs> Satan will leave you alone. <laughs> so the absence of trouble should actually be scarier than yes. the presence of tribulation. <laughs> now, let me be real with you. When you get serious about uh, getting started, about doing something for God, you're going to see all the drugs. <laughs> and all the alcohol, and all the dirty money, and all the sexy men and women, all the pulls and the desires to give up on your assignment that God gave you to finish, and then opt for a, the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. You'll see all of that. Satan is going to try and throw everything but the kitchen sink at you. Actually, he'll throw that at you, so he'll get you off of your purpose. Mm -hmm. But I prophesy over you that you will look his schemes and his temptations in the face and not see it as a sign of cursedness, but an opportunity to tell the devil, you tried that, but it didn't work. You will finish. You will endure. You will keep growing and growing in your faith because you are his. James' his definition of faith is endurance through temptation. Verses 13 and 14. Let no one say that he is tempted. Uh, let no one when he when he, I'm sorry, let no one when he is tempted say that I am tempted by the Lord, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each of us is tempted when we are drawn away by our own desires and enticed. Yeah. Number six is faith is accountability. Blaming God for being tempted. Who are we? Adam? No. <laughs> no. We the offspring of Christ. Amen. That we when we are enticed and tempted by Satan and we succumb to those temptations, we confess it. Let's get this straight. Satan can and he does entice us, but it is us who follows through with his suggestions. Amen. And we do it because it feels good. Come on. If sinning was pain and death, we would stay away from it and be perfect like Jesus. <laughs> but it don't. It feels good. And if we succumb to it, it's not Satan's fault. He, all he can do is talk. We do the doing. Amen. And it's not God's fault. We are accountable for and responsible for our own actions. Amen. We have shortcomings. And as believers, our faith says that we admit them and we work on them. Yes. James defines faith as accountability. Verse 16, James says, Do not be deceived, my brethren, for every good and perfect gift is from above. Number seven, faith is discerning. Faith can tell the difference between a gift and what looks like a gift. It can spot the lie from the truth. 
And often we're fooled by Satan and he entices us with things that look like gifts, but they're not. Mm -hmm. My pastor's wife tells a story about uh, this woman in the congregation years ago, and she looked at one of the deacons. She said, uh, Gigi, that's my husband. And Gigi turned around and looked at him. She was confused because she was like, wait a minute, that's somebody else's husband. <laughs> she said God told her oh. that that was her husband. Oh. Uh huh. Oh. And so faith um, uses scripture. Scripture. Faith uses scripture. Faith uses scripture to discern. What is the truth and what is a lie? God ain't told you that that man was your husband. <laughs> Faith don't turn us stupid, y'all. It is logical. And it follows the prescript of well-studied and well-reasoned scripture. Faith is based on truth and discipline. Come on. So when we discern the voice of, we are able to discern the voice of God from the voice of Satan, from the voice of us. Mm. James is defining faith as discernment. Verses 19 and 20. So then, my brethren, let every man be slow to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of God does not produce, I'm sorry, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Number eight, faith changes our nature. No longer are we slaves to our own self-interest and self-importance and self-righteousness and anger. Faith allows us to lay aside the old man and accept with humility what the word says about us. Yeah. And though it is a struggle to sometimes lay aside that old man because some of us deal with anger and self-importance and self-righteousness. But our faith gives us the power to change, even incrementally, so that we aren't just hearing it. Little by little, we are actively practicing it. Not from mechanism, like the Pharisees did, but this change is motivated by the faith that comes from the very heart of God. James is defining faith as the ability to change our nature. In verse 24, it says, for he uh, observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Number nine, faith is seeing ourselves as we truly are. Faith is transparency. Now, all of us have this idealized version of ourselves. We, we like to think that we, we would like to think that we're a certain way, and we would like you to think that we're a certain way, mm -hmm. how we portray ourselves at church. Mm -hmm. Pious and beautifully dressed, hair always combed. We go through the house flitting and singing hymns and doing devotional with the kids and feeding people from our very front doors. Um, yeah, instead I have a potty mouth. Um, it's getting worse as I get older because I no longer care as much. Mm. And I don't even really notice when I say things that I'm not supposed to. Mm. My hair most of the time looks a mess. Um, I ain't that pious. And I don't even listen to traditional gospel songs, let alone hymns. You'll catch me badly rapping Kendrick Lamar in my kitchen. Look out. <laughs> and so faith is looking into the scriptures and seeing ourselves not lying about who we are oh, and what yes. we see Amen. and not lying to other people about it either mm -hmm. but it's willing to say that i do belong to god mm -hmm. i am just broken yes. yeah. and god is gonna fix me mm -hmm. or i'm gonna fix myself mm -hmm. or actually it's a little bit of both because that is the process of sanctification yeah. We get caught up in pretending to be a certain way that Christians expect us to be instead of being real, instead of being authentic, sometimes conflicted, sometimes struggling, sometimes happy, loving sometimes, content when life is hard, struggling to be content when life is hard, but always, 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 always being real. Because if we aren't transparent and our faith doesn't drive us to be real, those who are looking for the God that we have will turn the other way mm -hmm. and say, I'm not as perfect as she pretends to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. James defines faith as living 
authentically and transparently. Verse 26. If anyone amongst you, among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, deceives his, his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Number 10, faith and religion are not the same thing. Now we talked about how James is refocusing and retraining how these believers in transition understand the transition. That he isn't just talking about a change in their behavior without changing their mind. He's talking about changing the mind, which naturally changes the behavior. In James 3, James says that the tongue is evil, but is he really saying that the tongue is evil? Or is his intent to say that the thoughts that precede the tongue have a great potential for evil? Those messed up beliefs, they come out of our mouth, they spew forth, they have the power of, of setting everything and everyone ablaze. So that James is trying to get us to see that the man, uh, that a man only says what he believes and if his thoughts are evil, his mouth and his behavior will be too. If you cannot change a man's mind, then his tongue will naturally only say what he thinks. And if he thinks that faith is mechanical and habitual and pharisaical religion, it's saying that he, James is saying that he's deceiving his own heart. Now that word in the Greek deceiving, it actually means cheating. He's cheating himself. He's cheating his heart by depriving it of real and saving faith and only feeding it activity of religion. Habitual. I'm practicing, I'm doing this over and over again. James is differentiating faith from religion. Finally, number 11, faith is fair. Now, when he gets to chapter two, James goes into great detail about being partial and favoritism. The example he first uses is rich and poor, but his focus is not just rich and poor. He's showing the disparity, how we view the disparity and what um, our actions with the rich and the poor say about us, what they say about how we think of faith, what they say about how we think of God how they translate into how we act out our faith. You see, it's the principle of the thing. James is saying that if you are partial with something of so little consequence as money, if we favor a person with money over a, favor, over a person without, that's how we are in real life. That's how we are with our obedience to God's law. That's how we are with our adherence to God's command. Instead of doing them all, we will pick and choose the ones that we like. Mm -hmm. We've heard it said that favor ain't fair. And if God, and as if God is guilty of favoritism, but the beginning of James 2 teaches that God is fair and so is favor. That if one person doesn't have abundance in one thing, that God gives them abundance in another area. He says he has chosen the poor to be rich in faith so that we understand that there is no partiality in God in any area and so there should be no partiality with us in any area. James defines faith as equality and fairness. And so as James mulls over the question, can faith save him? I'm sure he thought about scratching it out immediately after he wrote it being afraid that somebody would misunderstand what he was saying. But instead, he decided to keep it. He keeps the question that should make a Christian blush. He keeps the question that points out so much controversy even now. He puts it square in the middle of the page so that we can think over it, so that we can mull over it, so that we can consider it as deeply as he had so that the controversial question washes over us too. Can faith save him? A question if we misunderstand sounds apostate, it sounds absurd, heretical, blasphemous, unless we take into consideration what these people believed about faith. Unless we take into consideration what we believe about faith. 
unless we understand how to define it. Faith up until that point made people speak in tongues. It made people follow laws. It made grown men cut off their foreskin. It made people prophesy. And it means the same thing to us, except that we think it gets us houses and cars and jewels and things. And while faith, while James didn't give a clear definition, he did paint us a picture. James understood faith is not what it, I'm sorry, James understood faith is not by what it, by the definition, faith is by what it does. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We treat it as ambiguous, intangible, cloud-like. And if so, we can't properly, if, if so, we cannot properly define it. How can we know that we have it? But James found a way. He says, show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Mm -hmm. James, the entire time, has been defining the concept of faith, not with ambiguity, but by manifestation. He found a way to paint a picture using negative space. A thing that is so... Pastor, do you have that picture? Okay, okay. <laughs> Um, it, by using negative space. So uh, our negative space painting is you start with like a white, let's say a white or a black canvas and you have an image in mind. And so you paint around what you see that image is. So the white part ends up being the picture and the painted part ends up being the background. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So he started with a white canvas his book paints around faith. He draws the works of faith with broad and fine strokes. He uses pinks and greens and blues. He colors submission. He colors the power of wisdom. He colors discernment. He colors accountability with thick wooden paintbrushes. He's careful to paint around the white Faith exposing the outline, the silhouette of the thing. It, it eludes so many people, but um, it, so many believers to the point that faith means what you say, and faith means what you say, and faith means what you say. We look at faith today, and James says, it, how we define it today, it, James says, no, not so. This isn't about our own personal definitions, but, but the fruit that real saving faith mm -hmm. looks yeah. like. Mm -hmm. yeah. He draws a manifestation of uh, faith. He draws a manifestation of faith. He draws works so that we can see its true essence. He says, show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. And so since he painted the picture of what faith looks like, we come to the question again, can faith save him? Can it? James is asking if our de definition of faith matches what he knows to be faith. He's asking not just to inquire about somebody else's faith, but to internalize that question and ask it of ourselves. Is the quality of my faith good? Is it pure? Is it lasting? Is it enduring? Is it threatening to the enemy and worrisome to his kingdom? Is it fulfilling purpose? Is it submissive to God? Is it loyal? Is it fair? Is it transparent? Is it discerning? Is it the kind that evolves and increases? Is it accountable? Is it powerful? Are we rich in it? Does it make us flexible? Does it hope? Does it love? Mm -hmm. That is not a question he wants us to ask another man, even though he posed it that way. Mm -hmm. And neither does he want us to ask ourselves in a room full of people, what are we going to say, no? Mm -hmm. But he's asking us in the private recesses of our hearts. He's asking us to ask ourselves in our minds. He's asking us to be available for conviction and correction of the Spirit of God 
so that we won't be one of those people who says on that day, but Lord, Lord, I did this in your name. Mm. He is asking us to keep us from avoiding that whole entire situation. Mm. Mm. Can safe faith save him? That question is what we're supposed to use to make adjustments in our own spiritual life so that we can refocus, mm -hmm. so that we can recalibrate ourselves to be pleasing to God and convinced in our own minds yeah. that we have an eternal destination that is with him. Yeah. He's asking, can faith, faith, can faith save him? He's asking us, can your safe and what can your faith save you it's a worthy question it's the worthiest so let's reflect and paint our own pictures in our negative spaces so that we can ensure that we have a really good answer when the time comes amen amen <laughs> Just thank God for that. Amen. Yeah. Let us examine ourselves and make sure that we're in the faith. Yeah. Yes, Amen. Amen. If that wasn't uplifting and convicting at the same time, Amen. I don't know what was. Yeah. Amen. I got spanked off, but then I got raised up. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Praise Amen. God. We just yeah. love when Heather comes. Amen. Let's give the Lord another hand clap of praise. Yeah. Bless this family. Amen. Let's just pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for that word that came today. Lord, let us look inside the recesses of our hearts. And let us not get faint when you show us who we really are. Let us accept it. And let us get adjusted, corrected. And Lord, let us trust you. Because you're only doing it for our good and your glory. You said in your Bible, your word, Lord, that you are light unto the Gentiles and the Lord of Israel. Lord, we thank you. So, well, let's thank you for that word that went forth today. And let us meditate on it. Hey, we want to thank everybody that has watched Walking True Christian Fellowship Church. We always want you to be encouraged, blessed, and peace. And what? Walk, Walk in, in truth. truth. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to the Walk in Truth Christian Fellowship Church broadcast on the WITRN network. Come join us every Sunday at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time for Sunday worship. Bible study is held on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. We are located at 3006 North Lindbergh Boulevard Suite 711, St. Louis, Missouri, 63074. All are welcome and we look forward to seeing you soon.